having me here tonight. Um, I'm Neil Franklin, Executive Director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and uh, also who I, I have here with me tonight is, is Jim Garrick, and uh, he's one of our board members for the organization and one of our speakers. And uh, does anyone not know about law enforcement against prohibition? I know that a few people do. Does anyone not know about us? Has everyone heard about us and what we do? A little bit. Okay, a little bit. Well, let me, I'll give you a quick overview of uh, who we are and what we do. Um, we're an organization that was formed in 2002 by five cops who used to be drug warriors. These were cops involved in prohibition of drugs. And they came together because of after years of being in law enforcement and you know involved in arresting people for drug violations and and the likes and dealing with that that prohibition uh, atmosphere that we created in this country they realized that goals weren't being accomplished that we weren't reducing crime that we weren't reducing addiction that we weren't reducing death and disease now this is what we were told the war on drugs was about when it started back around 1971 with Richard Nixon. But it was about three decades into it when these guys, these five cops, realized that, you know, things don't appear to be going in the right direction. So they came together and formed the organization Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And that was five cops in 2002. Today, we are, we have 50,000 supporters, and that's cops and every, everybody. It's not just cops. It's prosecutors like Jim used to be, judges, corrections officials, prison wardens, federal agents. Every segment of the criminal justice system, because that's what you need from the beginning, where cops make the arrests, all the way through to prison, through the judicial system to prison, to really get a comprehensive view of what's going on. Now, we advocate to accomplish those goals that I mentioned through legalization of all drugs, regulation and control. We have to remove the profit motive from this. We have to take it out of the hands of the criminals. If we want to reduce the violence in our streets, if we want to reduce crime, if we want to have an effect upon addiction, if we want to keep drugs away from our kids, and to make a long story short, we have to focus on this from a health perspective, not one of criminal justice. We have a speaker's bureau of a little over 130 folks right now. And in order to be on our speakers bureau, you have to be of one of those law enforcement categories. And we have speakers in over 40 countries, and we have supporters of our organization in over 80 countries. And we have branches in a couple countries outside of the United States, like Brazil, Canada, and we're continuing to grow those branches. And we also realize that since the United States started this, this is where it has to end. And we also have to be effective in changing the treaty in the UN and the UN Convention. So that's why we're working outside of our country with law enforcement outside of our country and those who, those policymakers uh, as well. So that's a snapshot of our organization. We're a nonprofit organization, 501c3. And uh, raising money for our organization is pretty interesting because. <laughs> We don't have access to federal funding like many nonprofits do, unfortunately. But hopefully one day that'll change. Hopefully one day that'll change. Now, I used to be one of the most aggressive prohibitionists that there is. Um, I was a true drug warrior. I started in law enforcement back in the late 1970s with the Maryland State Police. 
And a year after working the road as a trooper in the Washington, D.C. area, I went into undercover work. You see, because especially back then, they were looking for young, good-looking black males. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you didn't have to be young. <laughs> no, seriously, though. Um, back then, they were looking for young black males and females to work undercover work. And when I went in, I worked in the Washington, D.C. suburbs and down into southern Maryland. Now, the immediate Washington, D.C. suburbs had a high uh, black population and Latino population, but down in southern Maryland, you did not. And I mentioned uh, at one of my talks earlier today about the first marijuana uh, case that I had, which was one marijuana plant growing in one pot on a balcony that I wrote a search warrant for. That was how they broke me in, in writing search warrants. So trivial. But I want to tell you about the first uh, real assignment that I had, which was down in Southern Maryland, which was a predominantly white community, county, and uh, I was called to that area, or I was requested to go to that area by the local judge, Judge Boone. And Judge Boone calls me into his chambers and says, we've got some problems here in Calvert County, and uh, it's two clubs, two establishments. One was called the Burroughs Club, and one was called the Duke's Lounge. The Burroughs Club was on a main drag, Route 4 in Southern Maryland, and it was a club managed and pretty much patronized by young African Americans, young blacks. The Duke's Lounge was actually in the town of Prince Frederick, and it was, if you build a wall from the corner of this wall over to this wall, this was the Duke's Lounge. It had a pool table had a jukebox and a makeshift bar over in the corner. And it was managed by a guy by the name of Gant, Mickey Gant. And Judge Boone says, I want Mickey Gant because I know he's dealing drugs out of that place. And I want you to go up to the Burroughs Club, the other night spot, and I want you to buy drugs out of that place because these places are a menace to our community. So I'm thinking I'm going to go into these places. It's going to be like fights and all kinds of violence. So I went into these places. Let me tell you. They were really nice places to hang out. And they liked to smoke their weed. So I went and bought weed. I didn't find anything else. All I found was weed. And that's what I bought out of the Burroughs Club, but not from the managers of the club, just from people who would frequent the club. The Duke's Lounge, I never bought anything from Mickey Gant. Not a thing. See, because that was a local spot, and I was an out-of-towner, and I just wasn't readily accepted. However, out in the parking lot, I met a couple folks. Never bought anything out in the parking lot. These folks I met in the parking lot took me to D.C. where I bought some dope. So I took my cases back to Judge Boone. Never went to court. Never testified about anything, because I know what happened. They made the arrest of these folks at both places, brought them in. The plea bargains were struck, because you're in Calvert County, you better agree to something. You don't want to go to trial in that community, especially being black. But he was able to close down both establishments because of that. As I went through my career, moving up the ladder, and, you know, then I was a young 20-something-year-old, and I really didn't get what was going on. I was not too long out of the academy, and, you know, I was just tunnel vision, and, you know, this is what we were taught to do. You know, these people weren't any good anyway, and, you know, 
even though I had a nice time at both places, <laughs> you know, <laughs> these people weren't any good, you know. So, so I went up through the ranks, and now I'm commanding drug task forces, multi-jurisdictional drug task forces for the entire northeast half of the state. So now I'm not out there making arrests, a handful of healing. I'm responsible for thousands of arrests being made. And here's something that's very interesting. I'm a major in the state police at this time, and I have a young trooper request a meeting with me. And his name is Sean. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of levels in between Sean and me in the hierarchy, and we usually don't grant just meetings with troopers. You got a sergeant, you got a lieutenant, you got a first sergeant, you got all these layers of whatever your issue is, you need to deal with it with them. Chain of command. Chain of command, absolutely. I was military, but they work it the same way, whether you're military or in the, in the police, it's a hierarchy, and you're supposed to right. follow, and if you don't, you're going to get shit canned. You got it. And he was not very comfortable with requesting this meeting with me because of those things. He, you know, he's, he's, you got to realize something. He's sidestepping his sergeant. He's sidestepping his first sergeant, detective sergeant, lieutenant, captain. But I, he briefly told me his issue was that he was being unfairly treated in his evaluation from his sergeant. It's like, okay, I hear these complaints all the time. But his complaint was I got a substandard evaluation because I'm not generating enough cases. And the reason I'm not generating enough cases is because I'm being loaned to other squads and for other cases. And I don't have enough time to generate my own cases. Mm. So I'm like, hmm. So I grant the meeting and I meet with him. And sure enough, the facts are there. What's happening is that as we in law enforcement target communities of color, there's a need for black and Latino undercover officers. And we didn't have many. So he's being farmed out to all these different groups, all these different squads. And um, even then, even though I realized that this was a problem and something was wrong, being in this so-called military environment, I still didn't quite get it and get the need to act on it. To get the need to act on it. Now, there were some other things that occurred throughout my career, such as the mayor of Baltimore, Kurt Schmoke, influencing me to take a look at what was going on with prohibition and how problematic it was for our communities crime-wise and health-wise and AIDS and hepatitis. And, but it wasn't until a certain time in my career when I really made this 180-degree change. And I'm going to talk, talk about that in a, in a couple of seconds. But what I want to do, I'm going to go through some quick slides just to make sure you guys understand the magnitude of this whole war on drugs thing, prohibition. And um, so just hang with me for a second. We're just going to look at some figures real quick, dealing with uh, incarceration mainly, and also the cost, the cost, the financial cost, uh, the limited financial resources that we have and where they're going. There's 10 reasons why we need to end prohibition. 10 reasons, and these are my reasons. Number one, to reduce crime. Number two, to reduce disease. Number three, to reduce addiction. Reduce death. Number four, number five, to reduce corruption. You know, there's a lot of corruption in law enforcement because of drug prohibition. It's all about money on both sides of the fence, no matter where we are. To refocus police priorities because we've lost our way, folks in law enforcement, to improve police relationships because, and you'll see as we get further into the program and we start talking about your rights, you'll understand why there's such a wedge in between law enforcement and community today, largely on the backs of prohibition. 
to defund criminals. They're making a lot of money, a lot of money, and no taxes being paid to save our economy, which is in the tank right now, and it needs a lot of attention. And I mentioned this earlier, to restrict drugs from kids, to limit access, to bring that down. Heroin used to be legal in this country back around 1900. You could go into a drugstore and buy it. Okay? And back then, uh, at least what they say is that we had a problem with addiction in this country to drugs at 1.3%. But it's my belief and the belief of many others that drug control, drug prohibition in this country has always been about social control about controlling populations and groups of people. Mm -hmm. Back here, the first drug, I mean, first real law against opium was against the Chinese. Chinese could not possess opium. Now, it wasn't for everyone, it was just the Chinese. And there are many circumstances surrounding that. And that's for another discussion. Mm -hmm. And that's why they invented heroin in the first place, to treat opium addiction. <laughs> Hey, I tell you, there's a, there's a lot of history here, and I wish I had time to go through all the history as it relates to drugs and prohibition. Um, probably spend a week or better. I was, I was saying what we, what we could probably do is have a, uh, like a, at least a morning session, <laughs> <laughs> then have break for lunch and then come back and mm -hmm. just break it down in, you know, to all these different segments, you know, and it would be, it would prove very, very interesting. This chart here is... Um, from the DEA briefing book of 2001, it's a heroin price and purity chart. Has anyone ever seen this before? Mm -hmm. You know, because one thing, number one, if, if we're winning this war, you know, if we're being successful with prohibition, a couple of things should happen. But one thing that should happen is that there should be less drugs coming in to the country and available for people. Now, this chart here runs from 1980 all the way down to 1999. And on the left you have price, on the right you have purity. And then this is for one dose of heroin, to get high one time from heroin. And the prices have been changed to reflect, by the DA, to reflect inflation so that we're comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges when we're talking about money, when I start talking about the price of one dose. Now, we're going to take this back into the 1970s, you know, because that's when the war on drugs so-called began. One dose, one little packet of heroin, $6.37 is what it costs. Now, the purity level was about 1.5%. Okay, of that packet, only 1.5% of it was actually heroin. Now, as you move forward to 1980, you notice that purity goes up to 3.6%, which means there's more drugs available because you don't have to cut it as much. The price is going down, went down to $3.90 per dose. Now let's jump all the way up to 1999, right before 2000. And that's the year I retired from the Maryland State Police. One dose, 80 cents. 38% purity. 38% purity. Now today, you can buy heroin above 90%. Gee. Pure. No wonder people are dying. And that's why people are able to snort it now, too, because it's so pure. So what this is like, and I always compare this to, like, um, gasoline, so people can relate to something. When gasoline is plentiful, at least when they tell us it's plentiful, mm -hmm. or not plentiful, and we, we don't know what the real story is there, but anyway, <laughs> when they say it's plentiful, prices go down. But when you have a, a hurricane in the Gulf and supply is limited, prices go up. So as you can see, we're not being effective in keeping drugs out of the country. Now, the money spent in 1970, direct costs in this country was at $100 million. $100 million. 2003, we're already up to $50 billion. $50 billion. And it's not getting any better. So, so far, so far, we know we've at least spent $1.3 trillion. 
during the entire four decades of the war on drugs. That's a lot of money. Sure is. That's a lot of money. Your tax dollars. Drug seizures. Look, you know, when I started working undercover and we would go out and seize drugs, an ounce of cocaine, I could get promoted. That was a big seizure. A quarter ounce of heroin was a good seizure. A couple pounds of marijuana was a good seizure. I mean, this was stuff that we would talk about in our circles. But as you move forward in time, today we're talking tons. Ten tons of heroin. We're, we're seizing container loads of cocaine today. And, and you know, they've they got the submarines and everything else bringing this stuff into the country. There's been a recent seizure of 147 tons of marijuana. So, as you can see, drugs are quite plentiful. And when we make one of these seizures, you know, back in the 1970s, when we seized a kilo of coke, it was felt in the street. Right. Today, we seize a container load of dope, and they don't even hiccup. Jeez. Don't even miss it. That's how much stuff is coming into this country. Let's talk about lives. Let's talk about overdoses. Per 100,000 users back in 1979, we had 28 deaths. In 2000, 141 deaths. So we're not making any headway there. And this is what I was talking about at the beginning when these goals weren't being accomplished. Let's talk about arrest. This chart here runs from 1970 to 2005. First column is total drug arrest. Second column is total marijuana arrest. And one over from that we have uh, marijuana trafficking and sales arrest and then marijuana possession all the way over on the end. You know, in 1970, total drug arrests were below a half a million. But these arrests quadruple for total drug arrests in 2005, 1.9 million. 1.9 million. Of that, 42% were marijuana-related arrests. And of that 42%, 89 were just for possession. 89% just for possession. Today, last year in New York City, they arrested over 50,000 people for marijuana possession. Over 50,000. And of that 50,000, 86% were black and Latino. 86% were black and Latino. Now, here's the here's catch. Here's the really surprising part, is that New York State has a drug decriminalization uh, um, law in effect, meaning that as long as you don't openly display it, it's not a criminal offense, and you just get a fine. But what was happening is that police were asking people to, hey, what you got in your pockets? You know, and people feeling that they're safe, oh, well, I can't get in trouble for this joint. But these two joints in my pocket, so they'll pull the pockets out and then show it, and then the police would charge them for displaying. Oh, and that's, that's why the, entrapment. Well, that's why the recent uh, uh, Mayor Kelly came out giving uh, instructions to the police department of, to stop doing that, but we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. And this chart here is just a, a graph to show you just how from 1970 to 2006, how we've gone from uh, less than that uh, half million all the way up. Uh, total arrest, 39 million arrests on that span of time from 1970 to 2006. 39 million. That's a lot of arrests. handcuff going on. Now, these, and these are nonviolent drug offenses, too. Nonviolent drug offenses. So, 2002% of the population that was addicted, well, it was still at 1.3%, according to uh, government studies. So, you know, we're not, we weren't being effective in reducing the percentage of people addicted to drugs. And this is all drugs. This is not any particular drug. This is all drugs. So, uh, at the beginning, around 1900, 1.3% when drugs were illegal and even after 40 years of the war on drugs, we're still relatively around the same rate, 1.3%. I mentioned earlier about the focus of police and where our priorities are. And this chart here is uh, dealing with um, clearance rates for murder, rape, robbery, 
aggravated assault, burglary, theft, and motor vehicle theft. Now, these are 2006 figures, and as you can see, in 2006, 60% of murders were solved, uh, at least were, arrests were made, 40% uh, of, uh, almost 41% of rapes, 25% of robberies, and uh, the list goes on. Um, aggravated assault, just about half. You know, that's, like I said, that's 2006, but here's the thing, you know, 40% of murders are unsolved. 60% of rapes and arsons are now unsolved. And you, you probably say, okay, so what are we comparing that to? But hold on to your seats. 75% of robberies, 83% of property crimes, unsolved. Pre-drug war, pre-drug war, we were solving 9 out of 10 murders, 91%. 91%. Today, as I said, 61%. And that's with less technology back then. You got it. We're supposed to have smarter policing, better technology. DNA is here now and, and, and the like. So what's going on? 30% fewer solved murders. Too many cold cases. Absolutely. Now, and we all know that Kids will find it easier, and this is through a uh, household survey, kids find it easier to buy marijuana than beer and cigarettes because as long as you have the money, you can find and buy marijuana. As a matter of fact, just about every kid today has one of these. So you don't even have to go anywhere. All you have to do is send a text message and they'll deliver it to you. Yeah. International drug trade... $500 billion. Globally, that's what criminals are making. The cartel, neighborhood gangs, $500 billion tax-free. It's a lot of money, folks. This here was found in a drug lord's home. That's, that's only $255 million. Damn, I could do a lot with that. That's only $255 million. $500 billion would be a room 2,000 times that size. That's ridiculous. That's a lot of money. And they don't count their money. And you know how long it would take to sit there and count one and a hundred dollar bills too. You know, one two. They weigh their money. One million dollars and one. You might need to know this for the day that you have this much money. One million dollars in one hundred dollar bills, thirty seven point one pounds. Damn. So that's something you need to know. Alternative policy solution is to remove the profit motive. Remove the profit motive. And that's how we'll deal with defunding criminals. You have to end prohibition to do that. And what that means is a form of legalization. These countries have already moved to decriminalize drugs. The Netherlands, Portugal, Mexico, Argentina, and most recently Greece for possession of small amounts. So, won't legalization cause everyone to use drugs? Mm -mm. Believe me, most people, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're going to use drugs, you're already doing it. In the Netherlands, marijuana use by 10th graders is at 28%. Know what it is here in the United States where we have prohibition? 41%. Portugal, 10 years ago, they moved to decriminalize possession in small amounts of all drugs for personal use. All drugs. So here's what's happened over the past 10 years in Portugal. Drug use by 13 to 15 year olds decreased by 25%. And you can find uh, this study by the Cato Institute online if you want to look at the details of it. And there's also been a more recent study to come out. Drug use by 16 and 19 year olds decreased by 22%. They're doing something right in Portugal. We need to learn from that. Heroin overdoses. Now we're talking about lives here. Cut in half, 52% decrease. That's important stuff. New cases 
of HIV infections decreased by 71%. People are seeking help, people are seeking treatment, people are, are not sharing as many needles as they did because the government has changed its policies. Real quick, back to incarceration, and then I'm going to, after I go through this, I'm going to wrap it up for you, and we're going to move on to some other things, and I'll tell you how I got to this point. In European nations, incarceration rates, 100,000. For 100,000 people, it's at or below 150 people. 150 people per 100,000. In the United States, March of 2008, the numbers were 1,009 here in the United States per 100,000. That's including everyone, no matter what your color is. 1,009 compared to 150. You know, we have 5% of the world's population here in this country, the land of the free. But we have one quarter of the world's prisoners. 25%, just about 25% of the world's prisoners. And most of those people are in prison because of drug offenses. That's what we created. And the prison industrial complex is another discussion. Prison, prison privatization and, and the list goes on. And this is just a graphic so you can get a visual picture of how this increase. Now this is federal prisoners from 1970 to 2005. The yellow is for all crimes, not separated from drug crimes. Uh, the red is for drug crimes. So Back in 1970, we had 3,384 people in the federal system for drug crimes, a little over 17,000 people for all the other crimes. Now, as we move through time, up to 2004 for all the other crimes, it increased 294%. Okay, crime is going up a little bit. But on the drug side, it increased 2,558%. It's a lot of people going to prison. That's under... Nixon's wonderful policies. The bottom line is all those people could be productive if they weren't in prison. That's something Absolutely. right there. And that's a good point because these people who are in prison, they're not buying cars, they're not buying homes, they're not contributing to the economy. You know, they're not shopping at the local Walmart. Everybody shops at Walmart because the Walmart says if they don't have it, you don't need it. So everybody shops there. <laughs> So they're not contributing. It's costing anywhere, depending upon where you are in the country, anywhere from $35,000 to $50,000 a year to house someone in prison. Very expensive. So who uses and sells drugs? Maybe, maybe it's because, you know, as it relates to disparity issues, maybe it's because more black people use and sell drugs. So maybe that's why there are more black people in prison. Well, whites constitute 72% of all drug users in the U.S. Blacks constitute 13.5% wow. of all drug users in the U.S. Who gets arrested? And we already talked about some of those numbers. 37% of those arrested for drug violations are black. Who goes to prison? 60% of those in state prisons for drug felonies are black. It's over half. Federal drug offenders, 81% are black. So blacks are now serving an average of six years while whites serve an average of four years in prison. That's where we are. Of the convicted defendants, 33% of whites receive a prison sentence. So that's once you're convicted, one third receive a prison sentence, while half of blacks receive a prison sentence. And there are a number of factors that play into that from representation, public defenders, plea bargaining, you know, the whole likes. So, three black males today, born today, one of them will spend time in the criminal justice system. Those odds aren't very good. Disenfranchisement, 14% of black men have lost the right to vote. Because of Unless you're in Texas, that's 31%. Because of being in jail for drug or other offenses? Absolutely, but there's some work is being done regarding those laws so that people can regain that right yeah, to vote, but it's still know, a long road to go. They've already got screwed hard enough as it is, and you can't even vote. That's ridiculous. Right, so it's... 
sure they're more than willing to put them to well, war, you know, send them to war and let their butts get shot off, but then they'll take their rights away. That's wrong. Absolutely. It's big problem, folks. Big problems. Incarceration rates. Now, here's something very interesting. When I break it down, the demographics. White males, incarceration rates in the United States per 100,000 white males, we incarcerate 943. Now, in 1993, in South Africa, we were really upset with them over apartheid because they were putting 851 black males in prison per 100,000. It was atrocious. So we had all these sanctions that we employed. In the United States in 2008, 4,919 black males in prison per 100,000. That's our apartheid. Ten times worse. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Um, talk about human rights. Mm -hmm. You know, even China's making fun of us right now regarding human rights. And they have the right to do it. So the outcomes of legalization, we would have 1.9 million less people in prison if we were to move in this direction. We would put 70 billion, low end, low end, low end, with what we're spending and what we could get from taxes, we would put $70 billion back into our economy every year. We only need a third of that to do wonderful things in education, wonderful things with treatment. Because we already know that the most effective way to reduce demand is through education and treatment, not the criminal justice system. We already know that. It's already been proven. Well, peer pressure can work well on both ends. You know, you can be pressured into doing drugs, but you can also be pressured not to do drugs. Absolutely. So where is it going to come from? Yeah, we just can't continue to put people in prison. No. we got to change our focus. So, how did I get here? I mean, yes... These numbers are compelling, but I didn't know about these numbers when I made my turn. I, and I'm continuing to learn more and more about prohibition and its problems and the need for us to move from this very dangerous place that we're in. But the way I got here was after I retired from the Maryland State Police, I went to work for the Baltimore Police Department as commander of training and Back at the Maryland State Police, a, a guy that had worked for me many times before, undercover, he had been working undercover for about 13, 14 years. The only two times I remember seeing Ed Totley in a uniform was when he came on a job and when we buried him. He had been working undercover for that long. This is a picture of Ed Totley and me in March of 2000, just a couple months after I retired. This is my retirement party. What he has in his hands on the left there is called a shadow box. That has all my insignia from when I was with the Maryland State Police. Pretty much shows my career. So he's presenting that to me because that's we get a lot of little gifts at your retirement party, but that's the one that you're kind of like waiting for. That's the last thing that they give to you, and so he's presenting that to me. And just a few months after this event, I'm talking with Ed about a case he's working. He's on an FBI task force at this time, working undercover in the Washington, D.C. area. And he's buying drugs from a cocaine from a mid-level dealer. You know, he's buying kilos of cocaine from this guy. And he had bought from this guy before, multiple times. There was no, you know, so he was very comfortable with the guy. They developed, at least he felt, some sort of a relationship so this particular night, he's making the final buy of cocaine. And he, was, he told me about, you know, okay, soon I'm going to be making this final buy of cocaine, you know, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, man, you know. And so we had done this before. He worked for me many times. But this particular night, Kofi, the guy, Orleans Lindsay, decided he wanted to keep all the money and all the drugs. Just, 
just decided. I don't know if he, you know, had some bills to pay or whatever, but this particular night, and he didn't know Ed was a cop, but he just wanted to keep all the drugs and all the money. So when they pull up to the location where he's going to go in and get the drugs and Ed sits in the car, and the surveillance team is watching, you know, the car is wired with video and sound, Guy comes back supposedly from out of the house, but literally what he did was just walked around the house and he came back around and he's smoking a cigarette outside of the car when he gets back to the car and then puts a cigarette out and just reaches in and shoots Ed totally point blank range in the back of the head. Didn't have a chance. And um, I got the call that night and uh, that 53-mile drive from my house to the hospital, and I know I was in triple figures the whole way, as far as this speed, but it was the longest ride of my life. By the time I got there, he had already died, and his wife was there, and his kids were there, And being in the position that I'm in as, you know, one who had been the commander of all these task forces where Ed had worked for me before. The first question I, you know, that comes to my mind, first of all, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm upset, I'm pissed, I'm hot, the emotions, and I'm like, who screwed up? Who screwed up? I mean... Who dropped the ball? Were the team members where they were supposed to be? I mean, what was, what went wrong? Who got too comfortable? And then I started to realize as I started thinking about all the other problems and, and all the other officers I knew back when I was working undercover, Marcellus Ward in Baltimore City working undercover, how he was shot in an apartment and killed. And other officers that I knew who had confronted drug dealers on a street corner who had been shot and killed that I knew in Baltimore. This is just in Baltimore. And then I realized, you know, what the problem is the policy. Why are we doing this stuff? Why are we putting people in harm's way? But then I, be, I realized something else. See, it just wasn't about Ed Totley and cops being killed and families being left behind. What about innocent people who aren't even players in this game at all? Mm -hmm. Seen these, right? Too many times. You, anywhere you go, any city you go in, you see these memorials that are up. You don't have to be in a war zone to be in a war zone. Absolutely. Not one city or community or neighborhood is safe as long as we have prohibition because we create this violent marketplace of competition, mostly among young men, young men of color, even though we know, we saw the percentages of who uses and sells more. But our communities have become extremely violent. It's an economic issue. I mean, it's an education issue. I mean, it's huge. Two years after Ed Totley was killed in Baltimore City, in this row home on the corner of Preston Street, there was a family of seven, the Dawson family. The father's not depicted here. They didn't have a photograph of him, but here is the mother and five children. On that corner, it was a favorite place for the neighborhood drug dealer. And the mother, Angela, got tired of her sons having to walk through and around and in that environment for a couple of reasons. Number one, she didn't want her boys recruited into that business. And number two, she didn't want them to catch a stray bullet because there was violence there. Both perfectly understandable. She began to work with the police to get him off of that corner. And he didn't like it. 
And if you look closely, you can see that the home apparently was on fire because he broke into the home early one morning and set the first floor on fire. And he killed seven people. That's Baltimore, but we have innocent people every day in every city being caught up in this, catching bullets and drive-by shootings and running gun battles. I don't care where you look. Go across our border to our neighbors in Mexico, and over the last four years or so, they've lost over 30,000 people murdered by cartel members. Yeah, it's gotten real nasty. 30,000 people. 30,000 lives. Venezuela, that number's over 40,000. Didn't they just like bury like 60 or 70 people underneath a bridge or something? You know, just like in one fell swoop. Every single day and week, they don't know what to expect from cartel members down there. Guns are flowing into that country from our country, even through the hands of the federal government. Sure, especially through the hands. They like destabilized countries. Absolutely. So the only way to make a difference here, the only way to end this is to end prohibition, to change our policies and deal with this as a health issue. Now, at the beginning of my talk, I was talking, and this is where I'm gonna segue into some things that will, will help you until we get these policies changed. I talked about some of our policing strategies. I talked about New York City and the challenges that they're having with marijuana arrests. Unfortunately, so many people do not know what their rights are. So many people. I was talking to someone earlier today uh, about your constitutional rights, about your rights, knowing your rights when dealing with police and police encounters. And they told me, they said, well, we have knowing your rights and then we have knowing your rights in Chicago. Uh. <laughs> so I don't know exactly what that means, but we're going to talk a little bit about your rights, protecting yourself during police encounters. Um, you know, what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to show you is not, you know, I'm not saying to you, you know, go out and, go out and do your thing and break the law and then this is how you get over. No, this is just so you know what your rights are. And, and this is what, when I was commanding the police academy for the Maryland State Police and then Baltimore City, one of the main things that we did, we taught police about the Constitution of the United States, and we made sure that they understood it and understood the amendments, mainly the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment. Because I wanted those police officers to understand that the people they're going to be dealing with in the streets and the community that it's their job as the police to also protect their rights because when we walk across that stage to graduate from our police academies, we, we hold up our right hand and we swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States. So, in my opinion, it's part of their responsibility to make sure your rights are protected, but that doesn't always seem to be the case out there. Many rights are being circumvented. So give me a second. The first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you a clip from, have any of you seen the, any parts of the 10 rules um, for dealing with police? It's by flexure rights. Mm -mm. Oh, then, okay. Then this should be really good for you. This, this video was filmed, actually filmed in Baltimore um, by a couple of guys that they did one a few years, a couple of years ago, and it just wasn't right. So they wanted to do it again and make it as realistic as possible. So I was the, um, um, whatever you want to call it, the um, subject matter expert or whatever, which is a technical, technical name for it, on the scene while they were filming it to make sure that 
what the police officer was doing was what happens. You were the consultant. Yeah. There you go. Technical advisor. I think that's what yeah. it was. <laughs> and uh, he really did a good job on this video. So I'm going to go ahead and run at least one clip. I might even do two because it is really important for you guys to see this. Pop <laughs> keep me all busy. Street thoughts got the feeling like a seesaw. Up, down, back up. I need to see more. The lean so mean, the gear all clean. Left arm up, steering the machine. Eyes in the rear view, gotta keep a clear view. When that money talk, the block gonna hear you. Ride with a ride, it'll die out. Every ass is moving, the strip got dry. Good evening, my friends. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Billy Murphy, and we're going to talk about how to deal with the police. I've been a judge, but I'm best known as a criminal defense lawyer. I know how the law works, and I know that for many people, the law sometimes doesn't work. But I'm going to show you how to make the law work for you. I see how the choices my clients make have a massive impact on the outcomes of their police encounters, even if and especially if you've done nothing wrong. There are lots of good police out there doing what needs to be done. And I don't need to tell you that there are also few too many cops who don't respect the basic rights of innocent people. But you don't get to choose who you're dealing with. And even the nicest cop will use your mistakes against you. That's precisely why every citizen, every one of you, must possess the tools to confidently assert your rights if you have to. By the show of hands, who's here because either you, a friend, or a family member has been on the business end of a bad police encounter? Then you're in the right place. Who's got a story they want to share with the class? What's your story? I got hassled by Highway Patrol the other day. Tell us about that. When that money talks, the block won't hear you. Ride with a ride, it'll be like I was ready to explode. This was like the fourth time this year I've been pulled over for nothing. <sighs> License and registration? Yeah, I know the drill, man. Excuse me? License? Registration. No need for the attitude there, bro. I'm looking out for your safety and everyone else's on this road. <laughs> Whatever, man. Okay, step out of the vehicle for me. Turn around and put your hands in the air. Turn around and put your hands in the air. Gosh, man. Walk forward. Walk forward. Hands on the hood. Hands on kidding? the hood of the car. Do it. What are you doing, man? Relax. I didn't do anything. Relax. God, I didn't do anything. You got a bad attitude. Now, I pulled you over because you were swerving between lanes. That's all. Now, you got a choice here. If you cooperate, you're going to make things a whole lot easier on yourself. Now, what that means is you got to be straight with me. You understand? Yeah. Here's the deal. You don't speak unless I ask a question. You understand? Yeah. All right. Oh, that hurts, man. That's too tight. Relax. You're fine. Now, where are you coming from? College. I'm coming home from college, man. You've been having problems with gangs moving guns down this highway. You're not packing any Tech Nines in there, are you? No. No, sir. So you don't mind if I take a look? Ah, go ahead. All right, Darren, you just relax. Don't move. Stand up. Stand up. Walk back with me. Keep walking. Keep walking. All right, have a seat. Have a seat, Darren. 
Now cross your legs. Cross your legs. And when that cop was done roughing me up, he made me sit there like a dog when he ripped up my car. I've got nothing to hide, but that's disrespectful. All right, you sit tight. I sat there forever while he hung out in his car. All right, Darren, stand up. Stand up. Turn around. <sighs> this is a citation for excessive lane change. Take care of this as soon as possible. Sign that. Sign it. Here's your copy. Get your sh my road. That cop profiled me. It's ridiculous. I go to school, I'm not a gun trafficker. I know exactly how you feel, man. That's why we're here. It's certainly possible you were profiled, but it's practically impossible to prove that. You never know for sure what's going on in an officer's head. I hate to say it, but from what I hear, it sounds like you broke the first rule of dealing with the police. Always be calm and cool. Hold up, are you saying that he deserved to get treated like that? No, what I'm saying is the police encounter is absolutely the worst time and place to vent your frustrations about police. Getting stopped by police is always frustrating and scary, but you could have played it much smarter by being calm and cool. As soon as you opened your mouth, you failed the attitude test. License and registration? <sighs> yeah, I know the drill, man. Your attitude only got worse. <sighs> Whatever, man. Don't ever talk back. Step out Don't ever raise your voice. Don't ever use profanity with the police officer. Turn around, put your hands in here. Being hostile with police is stupid <laughs> and dangerous. You can't win that game on the street where they're the king. Police have a dangerous job. Even the most professional officers might become aggressive if they feel threatened or if their authority is challenged. Always control your words, the tone of your voice and your body language. If you're visibly scared and angry, it's easy for an officer to get scared and angry too. Things could have turned out way worse than they did. Now, <laughs> On your stomach! On your stomach! Can you think of a better way you could have greeted that officer? Good evening, officer. How's it going? That's better. Calm and cool. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What's all this polite talk? They don't respect us, so why should we respect them? For real. This isn't just about respect. It's about common sense. If you don't check your ego at the door, and you let it take control of you during a police encounter, you'll regret it every time. Following the rules doesn't guarantee that the police will respect your rights, but they can keep you from digging yourself into a deeper hole. Let's talk about what your rights are in the first place. This is the Bill of Rights. These are the first 10 amendments that were added to the U.S. Constitution after it was ratified in 1789. These rights are protected under federal law, which means everything we're talking about today applies in all 50 states. There are three amendments in particular that protect your rights during police encounters. The Fourth Amendment states that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. The Fifth Amendment states that no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. 
During a police encounter, the smartest way to take the fifth is just to keep your mouth shut because you always have the right to remain silent. We'll talk in a minute about how this works. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. So if the police interrogate or arrest you, asking for a lawyer is a good way to assert your right to remain silent. Lawyer up. That's right. Regardless of what you have seen on TV, police don't usually have to read you your rights, even if you're arrested. So it's up to you to make sure that you understand the law and make smart choices. If police flag you down, pull over immediately, turn off your car, and place your hands on the wheel. The police like to see your hands for their own safety, so wait until they request your paperwork before reaching for it. At night, it's also a good idea to turn on the interior light so that the officer can see you're not armed. Darren, do you see any ways you could have handled yourself better? Good evening, officer. How's it going? Did you know you were swerving between lanes? No, officer. Let me see your license and registration. Sure. My license. Here's my registration. Now, Darren. We've had some problems with gangs moving guns down this highway. You're not packing any Tech 9s, are you? No, sir. I didn't think so. So you don't mind if I take a look, do you? Officer, I know you're just doing your job. I don't have any guns or whatever, but I don't consent to searches. Perfect. Rule number three. You have the right to refuse searches. This comes directly from the Fourth Amendment. For your Fourth Amendment protection to legally apply, you must be prepared to clearly state your refusal under pressure. Everyone, repeat after me. I don't consent to searches. I don't consent to searches. The officers can't hear you, so say it again. I don't consent to searches. One more time. I don't consent to searches. You a law student or something? So if I show that I know the rules, he might think I'm a law student. Or maybe I got big legal connections. Perhaps. But don't get carried away by saying stuff like, I know my rights, You have my faith, I'm going to you. Never tell the officer you know your rights. Show the officer you know your rights by asserting them calmly. You seem nervous. Is there anything in this car I need to know about? No, officer. All right. Please step out of the vehicle. Police may legally order you out of your vehicle, so you should comply. Walk back here with me. Stand right here for me. Now, you got two choices. You can make this better or worse for yourself. Now, if you cooperate, it's going to make things a lot easier on you. Beware that the police may legally lie to you, so never let false threats or promises trick you into waiving your rights. Now, if you don't, I'm going to call up a canine unit, and those dogs are going to rip apart your car. They're going to find what you're hiding. So what's it going to be? Refusing the search request is not evidence of guilt and doesn't give the officer the legal right to search or detain you. Don't get tricked. Unless you're detained or arrested, you may terminate the encounter at any time, but don't wait for the officer to dismiss you. Simply ask if you're free to go. There and those dogs are going to rip apart your car, and they're going to find what you're hiding. Like I said, what's it going to be? Officer, are you detaining me, or am I free to go? Good. This line can help withdraw you from an encounter. Saying you want to leave establishes that the encounter is not voluntary, which could help you later if you end up in court. Let's practice that line. Everyone repeat after me. Are you detaining me or am I free to go? Are you detaining me or am I free to go? One more time. Are you detaining me or am I free to go? All right. You want to play it like that? You want to bump it up to the next level? Fine. Just stay right here. Don't go anywhere. 
Asserting your rights won't make the police love you, but it might make them extra cautious about violating your rights. Darren, this is a citation for excessive lane changing. Take care of that as soon as possible. Thank you, officer. I understand refusing a search doesn't make me guilty, but if I'm doing nothing wrong, why don't I just let the police search me and get it done with? You have the right to let police search you. You also have the right to refuse. The choice is yours. But there are some reasons to think carefully about this. The officer isn't your butler. Searches can get real messy. If they damage anything, you might not be compensated because you agreed to the search. Besides, you never know for sure what a careless person, relative, friend, previous owner might have left in your car at some point. If the police find any illegal items after you consent to a search request, you can be arrested even if you had nothing to do with it. You have the right Consenting to a search request automatically makes the search legal in the eyes of the law. And the Fourth Amendment doesn't require officers to tell you about your right to refuse. So if you're pulled over, don't try to figure out whether or not the officer has probable cause to legally search you. You always have the right to refuse searches. I don't consent to searches. But they're going to search us anyway. Sometimes they will. But saying no isn't just about stopping the search. It might stop the search or it might not. Cross your leg. The point is that refusing the search could help you later if you end up in court. If the police search you without consent, your lawyer can challenge that. As your attorney, I'd be much more likely to win your case if you said no to the search. If I do not consent, when are police allowed to search my car? You mentioned probable cause. <laughs> what does that mean? Probable cause means police must have clear facts or evidence to believe you're involved in criminal activity. In other words, an officer's hunch without evidence of illegal activity is not enough to search or arrest you. But it doesn't take much. Most avoidable police searches happen not because police have probable cause. They happen because people get tricked or intimidated into consenting. So an expired registration isn't probable cause to search my car? No, it's not. But you still got to be careful. Courts are eager to uphold police searches, so something suspicious about you or your car could be considered probable cause. I'm not the kind of guy to tell you how you should express yourself. Expressing yourself is one thing, but exposing yourself to police by being a public nuisance is ignorant. Rule number six, don't expose yourself. Mr. Murphy. I appreciate you being here today talking about constitutional rights and all, but in my hood, police don't care about nobody's right. They do whatever they want. Tell us more. The other day, I was leaving my building on my way to work. There's uh, quite a bit more for this, but I want you to get the, the general sense of, you know, police interactions. This next scene, I'm, I'm not going to show it, but it deals with Police interaction while you're on foot, what we call the field interview by police. And uh, the same principles apply. Okay, you have the right to refuse a search, whether you're in your car or whether you're on foot, whether you're stopped on the street. Like Billy Murphy said, if they have probable cause to search you, when you pose the question, am I free to go? Or are you detaining me? Am I free to go? If they have probable cause to search you, they're going to detain you and search you. But you have to at least let it be known that you do not consent to searches. That you don't consent to searches. Not just in your car or when you're on foot, but also in your homes. We used to do, and I'm sure that some police agencies still do it, we refer to it as a knock and talk. Where we just, if we thought there was, like I said, a hunch, you heard him mention a hunch, no probable cause, but if we had a hunch something was going on in someone's home, we just walk up to the door and knock. Someone would answer the door and we'd start a conversation and we'd be in a neighborhood doing crime surveys or whatever the case may be. We can lie to you. 
Okay, we don't have to tell you the truth. And then we try to work our way in the home and then we're looking around. And you as a citizen, unfortunately, have to make it known, express that you do not consent to searches, whether it's your person, your car, or your home. Because if police start to search, and the courts have ruled this, if police start to search and you don't say, hey, you know, I don't want you to do that, I don't consent to searches, then consent is implied. Unfortunately, you as a citizen have to be vocal about that and, and let the police know that you don't consent. you got to grow a pair. <laughs> Pretty much, but as it was depicted in the video, do it with the right tone. Oh, absolutely. You know, cool and calm, it's just good advice, no matter how upset you may be. They cool could, and calm. They could be a good cop on a bad day, and you're going to have a bad day. Absolutely. And as, as Billy Murphy said, you're not going to win that fight nope. there at the scene. But you have to do things in a manner that if you are arrested for an improper search of some sort, that your attorney has something to defend you with. So that's why, you know, you have to, to exercise those rights and be vocal with that. Um, We um, use specific tactics when we, you know, have vehicle stops and, and encounter people. And um, the bottom line is we're thinking about how to, how to get into your car and how to, how to search you. Just real quick, this one next video, uh, just one thing that's different that was not in the, the scenario that you saw was when they stopped this young man who's walking down the street. And once again, you have to be comfortable with saying, you know, number one, I don't consent to searches. And then, you know, when you're, when you're asked for ID, first of all, if they have reasonable suspicion to ask for ID, then in some jurisdictions you're required to present ID. Because if, if, you know, when I say reasonable suspicion, if you match a description of someone who's just committed a crime, then they have that right to, to stop and detain you for a little bit of time to determine if you are in fact that person. And that's not probable cause, but it's kind of like in the middle, of, in between a hunch and probable cause. But if they don't have that right to detain you, you don't have to display ID, and, and the way to get by that is, you know, when they ask for ID, then once again you ask, excuse me, officer, but are you detaining me or am I free to go? And if they don't continue to detain you and they say, well, no, I'm not detaining you, as soon as they acknowledge that they're not detaining you, you say, well, you know, I'd like to stay and talk, but I got to go. And then end the encounter and move on. But once again, the key is just being cool and calm and knowing your rights and exercising those rights. So, and I think they make the entire vid video accessible online at Flex Your Rights um, on their website. And uh, if not, I know that, they, that you can actually purchase the, the DVD, but there are a couple more scenes on here and it's very informative. And I suggest that you um, find a way to get a copy Make this information known to your friends and your family to protect them, protect yourself, especially if you got kids. One of the things I did, I showed it. I have a son who's 27 years old, and I showed him this video. And another thing, um, the car that he has is in both his name and my name, and I told him that nobody searches this car. And if they're adamant about searching this car, then they can call me. But so you have to give instructions to your kids so that they protect themselves as, as well. I mean, it's your, it's your constitutional rights and you should exercise them. So uh, with that, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. I'll take a couple minutes and entertain some questions, either about the first part dealing with prohibition and the war on drugs and why we need to end it. Or the second part dealing with uh, 
your rights, knowing them and protecting them. This is a little off topic, but with all the stuff that's going on with the Occupy Wall Street and all that kind of stuff, some of these rules would apply to that. You know, be calm if the cops are hot, hassling you and all that other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And and I'll tell you, um, I spoke to one of our LEAP members uh, yesterday who was actually in New York and talking to both the people protesting a few days ago and the police down there. She just went down there. It was LEAP. And... Um, so she was going up to people and talking to them, asking them questions, thanking the protesters for being there and talking to the police. And, you know, she said the police were like, look, we understand what, what these folks are down here protesting about. We don't have a problem with that. You know, as long as they're, you know, being cool, exercising our rights, we don't have a problem with that. We're, we're here to make sure everybody's safe. I said, but we're not going to hassle them. But if they do things that cause us to... Do take action, then we'll take action, but we're not going to go over and above, mm -hmm. you know. So as long as those people, even if they do the things, because sometimes the strategies are to get arrested, to make a statement. Right. But as long as they do it in a manner where they're not raising a ruckus, those police that were on that scene are going to treat them with respect. At least that's what they told Lee Maddox, and she had no reason to believe otherwise. Mm -hmm. So you can do things, get your point across... You know, and, and, you know, this ties directly to prohibition and the war on drugs. Remember I mentioned earlier police and community relations? Because in many communities, the police are in uh, the mode of ocup occupying. They are an right. occupying force in those communities. And when you talk to the young people in those communities and you say, so, so, What's the relationship like between you and the police? And why? Well, you know, they only here to search us, our homes, stopping people every time you turn around. They stop in a car and searching cars. You know, that's the only reason they're here. When when we call them, because my mother's boyfriend is beating up on her, they're slow to respond. And then when they do respond, they don't act appropriately. They don't do what they need to do, and they think it's funny. Mm -hmm. And so, in their minds. The police are there time and time again to deal with drug issues, but slow to respond and respond inappropriately many times, not all the time, but many times when those things, when they respond for those things that are important to those folks in the community. Mm -hmm. So this whole thing of prohibition and the war on drugs has driven a wedge between police and communities. I don't know if I should say that. I got stopped the other day <laughs> going from Baltimore to Philadelphia in uh, Delaware on 95, and it's very interesting. You know, I, I, gotta, I gotta mention this. I'm moving with a group of traffic, and I'm in the far left lane, and there's a truck beside me, and I see the trooper, Delaware trooper on the side of the road, just sitting there in an unmarked car. Ah, believe me, we all know what they look like. <laughs> the car in front of me, and I saw him before the car in front of me, but we're all moving along, so the car in front of me hits his brakes. And of course, when the car hits the brakes, then the distance is going to decrease between my car and his car. And so we, then we pass the trooper's car on the side of the road. He, I see him look over. And then I move over as soon as I find it clear so that I'm not close behind this car. So I move over. And I look in my mirror. Here he is working his way through traffic. And I've done this for 20 some years. I know what he was doing. I know who was coming. He looked at me, saw me, the car I'm driving. And I'm like, no, nah, he's not. That's not why he's stopping me. And then I'm thinking, yeah, that's got to be why he's stopping me. So he pulls me over. He comes up to the car. And uh, I look at him. I said, uh, yes, Trooper, how you doing? License and registration. And I'm like, okay, here you go. Um, do you know why I stopped you? I said, no, honestly, I don't. Well, you were very close behind that car, and you were also traveling 78 miles per hour. I'm like, hmm. Okay, there's no way he could... The only way he could pick me out of traffic and say I'm traveling 78 miles per hour if he's using laser, because then you can actually pinpoint a car. So if he had anything, he had radar, because he wasn't using laser, because you have to be outside of the car. You can't shoot it through his car windows. And he was in his car. His windows were up. But then he says, but the main thing is that you were following too close the car in front of you. 
And I said, well, Trooper, I said, when a car applies its brakes suddenly, the distance is going to decrease between my car and his car. <laughs> and that's what you saw when we were going by. And as soon as I found it clear, I moved it out of the way so we didn't have that condition. It's like, well, it looked to me like you were behind that car for quite some time traveling that close. I'm like, okay. So uh, what brings you to Delaware? Now the conversation changes. So what brings you to Delaware? And for a split second, I was thinking, my car. <laughs> but then I remember the video, right? <laughs> I'm like, no, don't go there. Don't go there. I'm heading up towards Philly. Oh, and now he just asked me what brings me. I said, I'm heading up towards Philly. I'm going to the airport. He says, so uh, uh, you want to play some golf or something? Because I had on a pole. I'm like, what? So he's starting that conversation. Eventually he's going to get to asking me to search a car. So I said, look. I said, I know where you're going with this. I said, I'm a retired trooper from Maryland for 23 years. Oh, 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 oh. Um, do you have any ID? So I showed him my retirement ID. Oh, have a nice day. <laughs> See you later. I'm like, this is what it's all about. Uh-huh. This is what it's all about. So I, you know, I put my stuff away real quick and I pull off on the side of the road. And no sooner than I get up to speed, I look in my rear view mirror. And just that quick, he whips out and he pulls right in behind somebody else. Oh. It's no doubt in my mind that this trooper's going through the numbers. It's a numbers game. He'll just stop car after car after car. And, I, and I, unfortunately, I couldn't see who was driving the car that he stopped after me. But I had my suspicions. And that's what he's going to do on that road all day long is stop car after car. And eventually, he's going to find some poor schmuck. He says, I don't care if you search my car. Right. And they're carrying kilos of coke in the trunk. Well, I ain't got nothing to hide. <laughs> it happens all the time. Remember, if for some reason you have a brain fart and you allow that search to begin, you can always revoke it. Just because they begin doesn't mean they have to fit. If they're searching the car, you're like, well, wait a minute, flex your rights. Ten rules. Dang, I missed it. Um, hey, officer, you know, um, I'm revoking. I'd, I'd like to revoke my consent to search now. And I really have some place to be. So are you detaining me or am I free to go? Exercise your rights. Protect yourself and, and your family. That's a pretty good point because you never think yeah. about in the middle of the search. Yeah, you, you can, can stop. It. You can stop it. You can revoke it at any time. Talk, talk about the the drug war in general and how we got here. I mean, I can understand you know the, the prison lobby to the degree that we have private private prisons and even public prisons. They're always going to want more prisoners, more money. That I get. Right. From the police standpoint, and I can even understand from from the politician standpoint why you know somehow you get this way. But from the police standpoint, how much in that shift? Between you know that ninety one percent murder rate or conviction rate on murders to sixty percent conviction rate on murders and the huge explosion of drug crime, how much of that is true believing among law enforcement that this is the this is how law enforcement should be spending its time that they better serve the community by fighting the drug war instead of trying to solve murders and robberies versus the mentality that. You know, we're here to do our, we're, we're just going to do the job we're paid for. We're going to take the path of least resistance. It's a lot easier to do what you were just describing and sit and mm -hmm. find somebody with a couple kilos of coke than it is to actually go out and solve a murder. Most murderers tend to try and prevent themselves from getting caught. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are a lot of dynamics that, that come into play here. And number one, I mean, it's habit. We've been doing it for four decades now. And most of the cops who are on a job now know nothing different. They don't know what it was like before. You know, this is what they've been doing from the beginning. But even those cops that come on a job now, when you talk to most of them, they didn't come on a job to arrest pot smokers. Okay, they came on a job to be effective in, in reducing violent crime in a particular community. They really wanted to do good things. But then we get caught up in this, 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 this uh, drug warrior mode. Another piece of that is that, believe it or not, I mean, in these communities, these, these citizens in these communities, many times they do, hey, get these drug dealers off my corner. You know, they, they've been out here all night. They're out here all morning. You know, they, I, I hear the gunshots. You've got to do something about the drug dealers on my corner. So you have good citizens calling. So the police are thinking, okay, well, we got to go out and get drug dealers off the corner. You know, sometimes they focus just on that, but then sometimes they take it a little bit further and start violating the rights of people. 
I mean, there's so many dynamics that come into play here that it doesn't make sense to try to nibble away at all these different things that are taking place when the bottom line is if we end prohibition, if we move away from this enforcement model that we're currently in for drugs and end prohibition and set up a, a model of regulation and control, all of that goes away. Mandatory minimums, cocaine, crack disparity, powder versus crack disparity issues, um, the, the arrest being made in New York City, the arrest being made here for marijuana and cities across the vine. I mean, all of this stuff goes away. All of these, you know, and Jim really speaks to the money being made on both sides. I talked about the money being made by cartel and criminal gangs, you know, 500 billion, but even I'm getting paid working for a nonprofit to champion to, to talk about the reasons for ending the drug war. Right. <clears throat> but I'm making half of what I used to make. <laughs> so I'm not, you know, but, but that's an important thing because there's so many efforts for harm reduction on the back end of this. Everything from prison reform to in all these organizations. So tons of nonprofit organizations that are dealing with reentry issues and and, and, and juvenile delinquency and uh, uh, working with gangs and, and the list is long and then we have the prison industrial complex and we've got prison privatization and we've got courts and we've got overtime by cops, we've got overtime by corrections officials and, and, and the list goes on and on and on on both sides of this drug prohibition fence. People are getting paid. Right. Getting paid. And it's the people in the middle in these communities, from the people involved in the business to the innocent people that are getting shot and killed, and I mean all these people in the middle that are catching it from well, both sides. You've got, you've got you've got honest cops who are making an honest dollar, then you've got bad cops who are either making money shaking down people Absolutely. or they're stealing drugs from people and reselling them. God knows what else. Right. You know? So it's a big mess. I, mean, I used to balance the Baltimore police budget depending upon federal funds coming in for burn grants dealing with drug enforcement. So, and if I didn't have that money coming in, you know, I'd have to make some cuts. and I wouldn't have an academy class, you know, next month or whatever. And, I mean, so it's, it's, it's an issue, and it, that's why it has, to, it has to come from us. It has to, that's why we send speakers all over the place to talk about this and, and to start people doing things and moving in the right direction to, to end this. Go to him, and then I'll come over to you, sir. What's been your biggest um, kind of resistance from the community groups not necessarily from Here's something that's very interesting. <clears throat> the two biggest uh, uh, people supporting prohibition, groups of people, used to be cops and, and clergy, believe it or not. Um, cops are, I mean, you hardly really notice the shift in cops, but clergy were starting to see a shift, really starting to see a shift even in places like Virginia. Um, I did a presentation for a group of pastors in Virginia a couple weeks back, and not one disagreed. There was about 30 pastors in this group, and not one disagreed. Uh, when they came in, they were a little reluctant about it, but once you go through the, the figures and the facts, you know, you can't argue with these numbers and you can't argue with this stuff. And, and then they can relate it to what they're seeing in their in their communities and congregation. Um, even here in Chicago, you know, we met earlier with a member of the cloth and from the black church. Uh, is it Presbyterian uh, or Methodist? Methodist. Methodist. And um, he's right there with us. We got to end prohibition. We've got to end prohibition. Um, so that used to be a group that was uh, uh, sternly in, in support of prohibition, but that's starting to change. 
I don't know if many of you are familiar with Proposition 19 out in California last year for marijuana legalization. Uh, they were trying to move that forward. And one of the most outspoken pro prohibitions was a guy by the name of Bishop Allen who came out, I mean, all over TV and just wreaking havoc as a prohibitionist going against the NAACP out in California and just stirring up all kinds of stuff. I ended up meeting him at an event and we had debated once on a radio show and then I ended up meeting him at an event a couple of months back. And um, is he where I am? No. But he's not where he was when the Proposition 19 thing was going on. Um, so even he understands that this war on drugs prohibition thing has devastated the, the black community and communities of color. And um, when he's got other pastors and, and members of clergy saying, hey, well, man, we got some problems here. Um, so we're, we're starting to see a shift with that. Um, and now that we have momentum, we just have to keep it going. And once again, that's where you guys come in are so important and you know we definitely like for you guys to go onto our website um, at leap.cc and uh, you know sign on board with us and join us and uh, we'll keep you informed as to what we're doing and what's happening in this community of drug policy reform and from time to time we have action items that you can help us with and help move this this issue and make this change so yes sir you had a question lot of experiences, different experiences with police officers, and uh, so a lot of them, um, uh, sometimes they're really positive and they, they help, and sometimes it's really negative, you know, and I, I've been beat up by police officers in Kentucky, I've been put in jail for no reason. I was in L.A. County for two weeks uh, for hitchhiking, and I couldn't contact, I never got a phone call. My family looked for me and found me there, and that was the only way. I was not able able to even talk to anybody. I was just lost in the holding cell. Believe it or not, it was a nightmare. And um, and then they released me without my clothes had been stolen. And I was naked, but th that's not what I. Was <laughs> they gave me pants that had the crotch ripped out, and I had to ride the Greyhound bus. Oh my San God! Diego. So I had some really bad experiences with police officers here in Chicago. Like you said about stealing and selling crack, I've been offered to buy crack at half price by a police officer while just carrying a six pack, and I don't know if I looked that bad. But <laughs> I just, you know, and he got mad when I said no, I don't touch that stuff. He got upset with me because he's got a badge. He was in a car. I got his number, you know, and I was scared for my life. Um, but I've had a lot of positive experiences with police officers as well. And, and my question is, like, exerting your rights, um, how do you know um, if it's a, how do you know between the good cops and the bad cops? Because sometimes when you exert your rights, all of a sudden you find that you really have no rights and, and that you're being punished just for exerting your rights. And I've been in that situation before where I've been persecuted just for believing that I have rights. Well, and, first of all, you, you don't. There's really no way of telling whether you're dealing with a good cop or a bad cop until your encounter has terminated. Um, you always have your rights. Now, what they do with those rights is another story. But you always have those rights, and better to exert your rights and give your attorney an opportunity to defend you if you do happen to uh, end up on, you know, on the other side of the bars in a cell, arrested, um, then to, you know, not have exerted your rights, and then you're like, you're done. Yeah, I guess you do. So, standing up, like, I, I had a harassment suit out on police before. Um, they would, I couldn't leave the house without getting frisked for some reason, just because, I don't know, in the 80s, I guess, like, being um, a punk rocker was, like, a no-no. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know. And, I, and I'll tell you something else. I know there's been a lot of controversy about videotaping, you know, um, and there's some police officers that are arresting people for videotaping. You have to know the laws of your particular state, but I'm telling you for the most part, Maryland's got one of the most strict laws when it comes to electronic monitoring. So we're talking, you know, tape recording versus 
But in Maryland, for videoing without any sound, there is no uh, uh, law preventing that as long as it's in plain view. That's true now, in Illinois as well. In here, That's too? True in Illinois, yeah. And even if there's even voice, if there's no expectation of privacy, and the courts have already ruled in Maryland that a police officer doing their job on the side of the road, whether it's your encounter or someone else's encounter, there is no expectation of privacy. You know, it's a public servant out in the open doing their job. The key is, number one, if it's, if it's your encounter, um, you have the right to record it. But what I would do is say something like, officer, no offense to you. Believe me, this isn't personal, but my recorder's running. You know, just let them know. You know, because if it's, you know, for instance, on your phone, your voice, some people do that. They activate their little phone to record mode and put it in their pocket. But for that, you need to let that officer know he's being recorded in Maryland. Audio. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. the, the, the law's been challenged in the courts, and it's, the status is somewhat unclear at the moment. Right. But in some states, the right they have single consent, so you have to be aware of that. In Maryland, you got to have dual consent from both parties. Okay, so, I mean, this is stuff that you have to be aware of. But, you know, and also if your friend or somebody you see is having a complete, complete police encounter... You know, videotape it. Don't be all up on, you know, but get at a good distance and videotape it. If, if the police think you're too close for their safety, they'll let you know. And then you just, well, excuse me, well, how far do you want me to be? You know, go across the street. Then, then do that, but still video. But once again, it's all about the attitude and how you interact Absolutely. with the police. But like I said, in most states that I know of, you can <coughs> videotape what's going on. So... Just, just related to that issue, has, has Leap been involved with working with police departments to increase the use of, of videotaping with within routine police activity? Because I've seen, I've seen number. I saw a study that said of all uh, cases of uh, police misconduct where there was videotape evidence, ninety three percent of the time the police were cleared of misconduct. Which is to say that only you know a very small percentage of the time does the videotape, even when yeah. somebody's challenging, actually reveal legitimate misconduct. Which to me says. The police should be in favor of that technology. They should be wanting to put everything they do, interacting with the public at least, on yeah, that, tape to that, protect themselves from false claims. Right. That depends upon the police leadership. I know they're, they're, I know of some really good police leaders, and they want that. They're trying to get these video cameras in all of their cars and so on because <clears throat> they want their police officers to do the right thing, and they want that video to protect them, to show that they're doing the right thing. Um, but we, LEAP, don't do that. We try to stay focused on this one particular issue because that's where we're effective and that's what we don't want to get sidetracked or distracted doing other things. So our 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 mission is to end prohibition of drugs and once it's one and as I said once we do that then so many other things will fall into place and take care of themselves. Yes. Uh, what would be your timeline for seeing some change and reform in our drug policies on a national level? Tomorrow. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> we you know Timeline. Um, three years ago, there are many of us that thought we would never see this in our lifetime, any significant reform. But the way things are moving now, the way they've moved over the past couple of years, we're beginning to say, hey, we're going to see some significant reform within our lifetime. We just know that we have to keep chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away at this and can't become discouraged. Because yeah. it is going to take a long time. It's like turning an it's aircraft a mountain. carrier. You're trying to move a mountain, but yeah. you can't move it if you keep working at it. Right. So, you know, we, we can't be distracted or discouraged by looking at this <clears throat> huge issue in front of us. We just have to keep grabbing pieces of it and, you know, chipping away at it. Before you know it, it's going to come crumbling down. And we'll reach the t- tipping point and things will, will shift and change. Just from your experience of dealing with the law enforcement agencies? Like, where are we at right now as far as like, how police uh, accept the idea of you know, ending prohibition? You know, are they pretty open to it? Do they see that it has the potential to make their jobs easier? Or are they still kind of tunnel vision right now? And then what can we do to start getting more 
officers involved in, mm -hmm. on the bandwagon? Some do, most don't. Most are not there yet. Um, not At least not as a group. Um, but you'll find individuals. I mean, we have active police officers in our organization. Um, we don't have many active members in the hierarchy, but at some of the lower levels, we do have an active prison warden in our organization. So, I mean, we're, we're starting to, to chip away at this, but we still have a long way to go with, like, the International Chiefs of Police, you know, that group of folks, and many of the organizations that are out there, uh, many of the union organizations that are out there. It's a long way to go. We just got to keep getting it out there and, uh, you know, sharing the information and changing some minds. And we're making some progress. And am I happy with, personally happy with the progress we're making? No. So we're trying different things and we're going to be trying some more stuff to get into mainstream policing. One other question is, like, if you're in Chicago now, would you ever meet with like the police, the Chicago Police Department, and try to do a presentation for them in particular? It seems like they're the ones that really need to hear the message of the active police officers. Right. We've been successful in meeting with individual members of police departments. You know, the like today we met with someone from community services or community policing uh, in the police department. Um, yeah, I'd like to sit down with Gary McCarthy and, and talk about it. Um, in some forms, I had been able to do that with some higher-ups in police departments, some out in California and, and some of the other places. Um, but you got to remember something. We're having more success with sheriffs and sheriff's departments because sheriffs are elected, okay, and they feel that they can do whatever they want. If, the community, if they feel the community is about making drug policy changes, then they're cool, they're good to go. But for most of your police chiefs and commissioners, they answer to a city manager or a mayor. And they work at the pleasure of that mayor. So they have to follow the party line of that mayor. And that's the difference between a chief and a sheriff. The sheriff is pretty much their own boss answering to the people. But a chief has to do and follow whatever that the party line is with that mayor or city manager. So I know, I know chiefs that are like, when I, when I was with the Baltimore Police Department, I made this shift and this change. I went to my police commissioner at the time and said, look, I want to let you know something. I'm going to be speaking about this issue on my time. I'm not going to be representing the department. I just wanted to let you know that. He looks at me and says, cool, no problem. I don't have a problem with that at all. And um, he's no longer police chief or commissioner in Baltimore. He has a syndicated radio show now, and he's had me on here a couple of times because he agrees with us. Now, he couldn't say that when he was my commissioner because our mayor didn't agree with it at the time, even though he did, but he couldn't publicly say it because he would be out of a job the next day. No retirement. Absolutely. So, but... Uh, yeah, take a couple more questions and then, um, yeah, then we'll come over to you. We'll take these two over here. Yeah, along the same lines as, you know, first of all, I actually want to thank you for doing this. Yeah, Thanks absolutely. for having absolutely. me. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, um, this is great. And I wish more of my friends or people came out to see this. But um, I have a couple, you know, fraternity brothers from college. You know, we all used to smoke and whatever. And uh, they became cops after we, you know. <laughs> And uh, I haven't talked to them in a while just because, you know, I can get heated up, whatever, you know, in a conversation, debate about this. Time. So I don't want to start some unnecessary investigation or anything, you know. But uh, yeah. um, if, if somehow I were to tell them, you know, convince them to join the league or whatever, they would just come to your website. I mean, what, what's the process from that point on? Yeah, they can come to our website. We have a page on our website uh, where they can go to for law enforcement. And it answers some of those basic questions that law enforcement folks, that cops would have, like a Q&A for cops, for corrections, and, 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 and so on. And they can contact us right through the website. Um, my contact information is right on the website. And what we would do, we would, we would put them in contact with 
other cops who were members of LEAP to talk to them and answer those questions that they had. And if they're corrections, we'd put them in touch with folks from corrections, federal agents, folks who were federal agents. Prosecutors, we'll put them in touch with folks like Jim. So yeah, I mean, they can go right to our website and get some basic information and then they can communicate directly with us. And that's, that's what we do. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and try to change it internally somehow. Uh, absolutely. That's what we're doing. Definitely one of our goals. Uh, with the whole uh, war on drugs, um, do you think the stance of prohibitionists is that of um, a generational issue? And also, um, do you think uh, the pharmaceutical companies really play a role in keeping prohibition, uh, keeping moving forward with the uh, whole process of not decriminalizing uh, drugs? Uh, yes and yes. Um, <laughs> I think... From what I'm seeing generationally, now, and even this is kind of interesting, generational-wise, because even though I see a lot of young people who really get it, if you do the numbers from some of the polling that we've done, like out in California with Proposition 19, the polling of young people really, is really high as it relates to them uh, supporting that particular measure, uh, that initiative. But Sunday... I gave a presentation at a church in Baltimore where I guess there were about maybe 25 to 30 people in the audience and the average age was probably about 70, 72, hmm. 75 maybe. I mean, there were people coming in in walkers. I mean, quite a few with canes. And I mean, and when it was all said and done, you know, even at the beginning, a couple of them were like, yeah, I know. <laughs> We had prohibition of alcohol, and they, they know more about the prohibition of alcohol than what young people do. So they e equated to that. But even the ones that weren't there when they came in the door after the presentation, not a single one said, um, Mr. Franklin, I don't agree with you. Right. So here's an older generation that gets it. Younger generation, we know for the most part, they get it. And I think really the stigma is probably the folks in the middle. Yeah. I think it's like, from what I'm seeing, it's more so that, that group in the middle that is the, the, the toughest crowd uh, to deal with. But, um, you know. How long was alcohol keep that prohibition? 13. 13 years. Okay, so didn't take long for them to realize <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, right. and they didn't even have a plan of where to go all they knew is that 18th amendment you gotta go Right. it's too violent it's too costly and our kids are being it's interesting that women played a significant role in enacting the 18th amendment then on the flip side of that they played a significant role turning it around absolutely and that's what we are doing. Actually, you guys are, are doing something here in Chicago with mothers. With mothers, moms, pretty much starting here in Chicago. Um, and, you know, in other areas of the country. But you have a, a big portion of those, those women, we were speaking with one tonight, um, moms against prohibition, who are beginning to move that issue as well from the concern, dealing with the concerns well, the only, the of the only children. way it's going to turn around, obviously, is if everybody that's being impacted by it gets a vested interest and decides to step up to the plate and do what they can to turn around because it's going to take voices from the inside and the outside. Yeah, it's, 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 it's going to take a movement to really, to really do this. And um, so that's why it's important that you guys share this information, that you share the websites, that you... You know, you point people, you know, to these places so that they can learn more and places where they can take action. You know, if you know about certain pieces of legislation being passed or being presented in Chicago or wherever you're from, you know, to move this issue, then you got to support that. And you got to get other people to support it, too. Um, and then for those policymakers that are doing things that they shouldn't be doing, like trying to maybe increase um, uh, penalties, or penalties uh, yeah, minimum sentencing, uh, you know, build more prisons. We just had a group of folks, they wanted to build another juvenile prison in Baltimore. They just built one a few years ago. They wanted yeah. to build another one. And people came together and said, no, no, no. And they stopped it. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what needs to happen on a frequent basis for all of these things that folks... Prison privatization? You know, you guys... You don't have any in Illinois yet, do you? Nope. Don't let it come to your state. So you got to keep your eyes and ears open for what's going on. And, you know, and just don't let things happen. No. So... That's what we're trying to do. Uh, Grassroots. Once again, thank you for showing up. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys.